This episode of Outlines contains descriptions of a crime which some people may find distressing, so, as always, discretion is advised. Just south of the city of Reading in Berkshire, lying a little to the north of the M4, the motorway which splits the lower half of the UK horizontally between London and South Wales, there is a small hamlet named Pingewood. If you look at the area on a map, you'll see that it isn't typical to the Berkshire landscape. There's small winding lanes and clusters of woods and trees. But what makes it unusual are the lakes. The lanes themselves carve paths between them. And while there are a scatter of industrial buildings and residential properties around the edge of the area, the lakes are what set the landscape apart. There's Main Lake, Gold Lake, Pingewood Lagoon and Blue Pool, which appears, as named, a rich blue in comparison to the green of the surrounding waters. There are water sports areas, a skiing and wakeboard centre and the Island Sailing Club, which sits just off of Seals Farm Lane, the place where today's episode begins. In 1993, the area around Seals Farm Lane, which then was no more than a narrow, rutted track, was private. The road lined with woodland and rough undergrowth. Throughout the day, fishermen and sailors could often be seen at the nearby lakes, but at night time, the waters and surrounding woodland shifted and changed to become silent, almost eerie in the absolute darkness. It was then that the area became something different. A place for joyriders. A lonely spot where car thieves could dispose of vehicles by dumping or burning. And one where, if you wanted to slip by unnoticed, despite the scattering of nearby properties, you probably could. It was around 9.07 on the evening of Thursday the 14th of January that two couples in nearby cottages heard the familiar sound of a shot ring out through the countryside. One of the residents, a member of the local gun club, remembered hearing the sound which they described as being that of a single shotgun discharge. Another local later told the papers, around here you don't take any notice of bangs, people often shoot the ducks and rabbits. It wasn't until mid-afternoon of the next day that anyone realised that something more sinister had happened that January evening. It was approximately 2pm when a couple who were driving down Seals Farm Lane spotted the body of a man. He was in a clearing in the woods, just off of the roadside. Concerned, they took a closer look. He lay completely still, clothed in a blue denim shirt with a t-shirt underneath, blue jeans and brown shoes. To his head, there was a clearly visible injury. Quickly, the couple called the police, and it was determined by the pathologist Vesna Durovich that he had died of a single shotgun wound to the head. There were no signs of a struggle. He had not been restrained, nor had he fought his attackers. The man had been made to kneel in the clearing and then had been shot from close range in the back of the head with a 12-bore double-barrelled shotgun, falling forward as the bullet which shattered his skull was fired. This was 30-year-old David Watkins, a quiet family man with two young sons who worked part-time as a delivery driver supplementing his income with small-scale cannabis dealing. As of 2019, David's murder is a solved case, although it transpires that the man responsible for his death could have been convicted 25 years earlier. And it's only thanks to the 2003 Criminal Justice Act, specifically the reforms to the Double Jeopardy Law, that he could be found guilty at all. I'm Jess Carter, 
and this is a Patreon exclusive episode of the Outlines podcast. Thursday the 14th of January 1993, David started the day by hiring a van from a company named Budget. This was his regular routine on the days he worked as a delivery driver. That Thursday, his job saw him travelling on a 350 mile round trip. It appears as if, at some point during the course of the day, he telephoned his partner, Sue, telling her that she should give a message to a man named Drew, if Drew were to call while he was at work. At some point that day, he did indeed call, and Sue passed the message, reportedly a code relating to a drug deal that David and Drew were set for later that day. While Sue wasn't dealing drugs, she knew that David had been supplying cannabis to his friends, later telling the Reading Evening Post that she never asked him about it, saying, about two years before his death was when he started to deal. He normally popped out and phoned from a telephone kiosk at the end of the road. Despite the fact that David's dealings had previously got him in trouble with the police, he, Sue, and their two young sons lived a quiet life on Salisbury Road in Reading. The couple had met in May 1987, and Sue remembered that they were comfortable in each other's company. He made her laugh, and it didn't take long before he moved in with her, and the two began their life together. A year later, Sue fell pregnant, and at 25 weeks she told David, swearing him to secrecy. A secrecy that lasted no more than a few minutes, as he called around his family, excited to share the news. She described him as an extremely proud father. We were his world, she said, and he would do anything for us. He worked hard and supported his family, and when he wasn't working, he would spend quality time with our boys. Sue spoke of how kind he was, once inviting a friend for Christmas dinner as he knew that otherwise the friend would be alone that day. This, according to Sue, was just what David was like, always thinking of others. A neighbour who spoke to the Post a few days after the shooting said, He seemed to be a very jolly and good dad. I thought they were a very happy, normal couple. The newspapers, attempting to address this, would tell of how David lived a dual life, delivery driver and family man, but also a drug dealer. On that January day, it was early evening when David called Sue to tell her he was on his way home. The couple's young children were ready for bed, but Sue let them stay up to wait for their dad to come home. I'm so pleased I let them stay up that night, she said, remembering how David arrived back and played a while with the kids before they went to bed. A short while later, he nipped out to buy cigarettes, returning not long after with a friend of his named Darren Bedwell. Darren was there to collect what he described as puff, but David didn't have any. Darren remembered the phone ringing, and David speaking to a man on the other end, telling him after the phone call ended that it was sorted and that he was going to get three kilos of cannabis. Darren, who later denied accompanying David on his drug deals in the capacity of a minder, did ask if he needed to go with him. Now, David said, Drew's safe. He wasn't his regular dealer, but the two of them had known each other since the previous year, and he'd bought from him before. The friends made plans for David to call around at Darren's caravan, 
at Mere Oak Caravan Park when he'd finished the deal, and Darren observed how David began to stuff what looked like thousands of pounds into a black nylon rucksack from their position on the kitchen counter. At around 8.30pm, David kissed the children goodnight and left the house. In the rucksack, he carried somewhere in the region of six to seven thousand pounds in bundled notes. As well as this, he wore a bum bag in which was another six hundred and ninety-five pounds, as well as his driver's licence and credit cards. That evening, Darren waited for his friend to show, but he never did. At their home in Salisbury Avenue, Sue wasn't concerned when David didn't return that evening. It wasn't unusual for him to stay out overnight, although generally he would phone her to let her know that he wasn't coming back. It was around 17 hours after he left home on the 14th before he was found in the clearing off of Seals Farm Road, and Sue recalled how she saw on the news that a body had been discovered there. Unaware until later that day, when the police arrived at her door, that it was David who had been murdered. She said, When the police came round to tell me that David had been killed, it was total disbelief. She remembered having to tell her eldest son what had happened. First by just saying that his father had died, and then, months later, gently telling him a version of the truth. I told him that a bad man had killed his daddy. Is the bad man going to kill us? was his reply. No, she said. The police have their man. That January, as Sue had begun to attempt to deal with what had happened to her partner, the police were indeed closing in on their suspect, although no one could have foreseen how long it would take before he would finally be jailed for the crime. On Sunday the 17th of January, Sergeant Paul Brightwell of Thames Valley Police spoke to the Sunday Mirror, telling them, This was a calculated killing, and we are looking for a cold-blooded murderer. It has the hallmarks of an execution, because he was killed at the scene, and he still had money in his pockets. At that point, Regardless of the fact that David was already known to the police as a drug dealer, Sergeant Brightwell, either genuinely or with an eye to keeping the force's cards close to their chests, said, We have nothing positive to suggest drugs as a motive, but we are not ruling anything out. By Monday the 18th, fingertip searches of the woodlands surrounding Seals Farm Lane had been conducted, and on the following day, an official appeal was issued for anyone who might have seen David's hire van on either the night he died or the day after to come forward. The van, whose keys had been found clutched in David's left hand, had itself been discovered at around midnight on Friday the 15th. It was locked up at the western end of Granville Road in Reading, just over two miles, or a six-minute drive away from where David was murdered. Opposite the place where the van was parked was an SO petrol station, and it didn't take long for the cashier who'd been working the night of January the 14th to recall that at around 9.22pm, he'd seen a vehicle with the words budget rent van on it reverse into Granville Road and park up. As far as he could recall, there was only one man in the vehicle at the time. There was actually, considering the cold-blooded nature of the killing, a surprising lack of information in the papers in the weeks following David's murder. And yet, despite the scant updates, it appears as if, shortly after his death, police accidentally stumbled across the man who would become their main suspect. It's not clear exactly when this occurred, but it happened shortly after the 14th of January, when police called at the house of a man named Andrew Everson. Andrew was a petty criminal, who had been in and out of prison from a young age on a variety of different charges. That day, when officers knocked at his door, Andrew panicked, 
jumping out of an upstairs window and running across the garden. When caught, he was clutching a wash bag which on examination contained £3,500 in cash. The money, police noted, was bundled in a similar fashion to the way in which David Watkins was known to have sorted his notes. While initially they had intended to pick up Andrew on an unrelated charge, following his unusual behaviour and the large amount of cash he'd been attempting to run with, police began to have their suspicions. Initially there was nothing to link the two men, though they thought Andrew could have been the man named Drew, the one who David had arranged to buy cannabis from on the evening of his death. With no evidence at that time, police were forced to release him, but by the 24th of January, only 10 days after David's death, Andrew was picked up again. He was in London at an SO petrol station along with his girlfriend Tracy, and the two of them were taken back to Berkshire, with police transporting their car back separately. On January the 27th, 13 days after the killing, Andrew Everson was charged with the murder of David Watkins. Because of the speed with which police had arrested and then charged Andrew, there isn't much else to talk about in terms of the early investigation itself. Behind the scenes, though, plenty was being done to establish that Everson was the mysterious Drew. The murder weapon itself had still not been found, which complicated matters slightly. But by the 27th of January, they obviously believed that regardless of this, they had enough evidence to state with a degree of certainty that Andrew Everson was guilty. Everson, for his part, refused to confess to being a drug dealer, repeatedly insisting that he had neither met David on the night of the killing nor ever supplied him with drugs, although he did admit to having known him. The £3,500 with which he had been attempting to flee following his first arrest, he claimed had been given to him by his father. His father, on the other hand, categorically denied this. Despite their early investigative speed, it wasn't until January of 1994 that Andrew Everson would finally stand trial for David's murder. The trial itself was a stuttering affair, and just three days in, the judge, Justice Latham, ordered that it be halted and the twelve jurors discharged. No reason was publicly given for this decision, but it resumed in very early February. The police case itself seems to have come at Everson from a number of different angles. They had no murder weapon, no direct evidence that he was at the scene, and no scientific evidence linking him there either. The disbanded first trial began with information being offered as to Everson's problems with money. Michael Lawson QC, who was prosecuting the case, told of how he had, in the weeks before David's death, begun to fall upon hard times. Everson was known for being flashy with money after making deals, and he and his girlfriend Tracy would stay in hotels and guest houses. He once paid £6,000 for a new car, and in December of 1992, he'd put down £1,000 to rent a flat in Marigold Close in nearby Crowthorn. Remember, Everson was continuing to deny having been a drug dealer, and yet a friend recalled him asking once, have you ever seen so much money in your life, as he emerged from a flat with a carrier bag stuffed full of cash. Following this, though, Michael Lawson said, Everson's phone and electric had been cut off, and he'd even filled up his car with £18 worth of petrol, driving away without paying. A friend of Andrew's, named Jim Bayliss, told anecdotes relating to Everson's relationship with money. On one occasion, Bayliss remembered, Everson was in my girlfriend's house. He had a bundle of notes in his pocket, 
seven or eight thousand pounds. He was always flash. My girlfriend asked if he could lend her some money. He took out a wad of notes and just gave some to her. He liked to let everybody know that he had money. Conversely, Bayliss recalled, on one occasion, since Everson had moved to Marigold Close, maybe two or three weeks before the murder occurred, he said of him, I knew he had no money. He said he was skint. Then, straight after the death of David Watkins, Bayliss recalled that Andrew was back to his old ways. He allegedly embarked on a spending spree, paid off his debts, and even sent a friend back to the petrol station to pay off the amount he owed there. While it wasn't a dead certainty that Everson's sudden windfall was related to David's murder, when the cash which was found in the shower bag as Everson fled from the police was examined, incriminating evidence was discovered in the form of two fingerprints, both David's on the notes. Again, Everson continued to claim that the money was the result of a cheque that his father had given him and that he had cashed it at a shop somewhere in Reading and he had no idea how David Watkins' fingerprints could have gotten onto the money. While Everson's sudden wealth was one of the strands police had stitched together, another, more directly damning, came from Andrew's girlfriend, Tracy Dennard, who claimed that in the days following David's murder, Everson had actually confessed to her that he'd committed the crime. Telling the court of her struggle to decide whether to share this information with the police, Tracy said, I made the decision to tell police everything Andrew Everson had told me about the murder after fighting with my conscience over the weeks. Even though he had told me he had committed the murder, I was trying to kid myself he didn't. I went to my mum's grave and told her to tell me what to do. Then I was walking and I found myself at the police station. She claimed that before telling her anything, Andrew checked her for recording devices and then he told her that he had done it, adding that the day before the murder took place, he had driven to Pingewood in order to stake out the location where it was going to happen. When she had asked why, he said that it was politics and that she wouldn't understand. Although, he went on, David Watkins was about to stand trial for a drugs case, a fact which was confirmed by the police, and Everson was worried that he may become implicated in the case. In Tracy's initial statement, she said that four days after the murder had taken place, Andrew confessed. A day later, she claimed he said that he had burned tracksuit bottoms, black Reebok trainers and a Levi shirt that he had been wearing when he had committed the murder. Later, when she had visited him in prison, he again provided her with more information, saying that he had a friend, known mysteriously as either Mr M or Jose, and that he and this friend had travelled to Pingewood in a van. He claimed, without providing any further reason as to why, that Mr M told David Watkins to get on his knees, and then Everson shot him. They buried the gun, she said, using a shovel which Everson carried in the boot of his vehicle, and he and Mr M used a cream roll-neck jumper to clean off their hands. Alongside Tracy's evidence was that of a man named Neil Pearson, Pearson had been in prison at the same time as Everson, and he told the court he said he had done it because he had been ripped off by him. He might have been joking. I don't know. He told me they would never find the gun. Vivian Robinson, who was defending Everson, claimed that this statement had been made up by Pearson in order to, as he put it, help himself. Mr Robinson was quick to point out discrepancies between Pearson's police statements and the information he provided in court. It might sound as if all of the police's case came from hearsay, and while the majority of it does appear to have been based on the testimony of those who knew Everson, there was some scientific evidence to add to the prosecution's case. I'll talk in much more detail about this in part two, 
and for now, tell you that while there was nothing to link Everson to the scene, police who had done extensive testing on his car, a Peugeot 309 GTI, as well as testing on a number of items of David's clothing, discovered that there was evidence of gunshot residue in the car. While this couldn't be linked directly to the crime itself, there was also the matter of fibres taken from David Watkins' clothing that were linked directly to the cars of the type driven by Everson. There is some speculation to suggest that at the initial 1994 trial, the likelihood of these fibres having been transferred from Andrew Everson's Peugeot was not stressed enough, although there are apparently no transcripts for the trial itself. And so this assumption was made by experts who, years later, when asked to re-examine the evidence, could not understand how it was that this clearly valuable link was not given more weight during the initial trial. By Thursday the 10th of February 1994, the trial was due to draw to a close. Vivian Robinson, Speaking for Everson was keen to point out that the case was riddled with inconsistencies. The witnesses, he said, all had other motivations to point the finger at Andrew Everson. Evidence, he claimed, had been given by demonstrably unreliable sources and that the prosecution was sweeping away an embarrassment under the carpet by saying aspects of the case did not warrant further discussion. As for the evidence itself, Mr Robinson was very definite that there was nothing placing his client at the scene and even claimed that Everson himself believed he was being fitted up and that the police were putting pressure on his friends and acquaintances to provide them with information they could use. In his summation, Justice Latham spoke of the witnesses, saying that Tracy Dennard had a yo-yo attitude to relationships and that she was no angel. He spoke of how Tracy and Andrew had met when she was in a vulnerable state following the death of her mother, and he told the jury, not only did she have previous convictions, but she had no compunction, if she's right, of being with a man who she thought had a shotgun for the purpose of carrying out an armed robbery. It's clear the police were pressuring her and those who knew David Watkins. On Monday the 14th of February 1994, after seven hours and 50 minutes, the jury returned their verdict of not guilty. Speaking after it was announced, Everson's solicitor Anil Rajani spoke about the way the police had handled the inquiry, saying, it's clear criticisms have been made of the police and ought to have been. They went after one man and one man alone they relied on witnesses with a range of previous convictions. Only then did it emerge that Everson's former girlfriend had complained to Mr Rajani that police were harassing her and that they had attempted to offer cash to two of her friends in exchange for information against Andrew. For his part, Detective Superintendent John Stowe, the man who had led the investigation, was forced to say that there had been no complaints from any of the witnesses and that no undue pressure had been put on anyone connected with the case. He also denied that police had been gathering evidence knowing that drug users and dealers would wish to point the finger at Everson so that they didn't become suspects themselves. While this all still seems to be unsubstantiated, it's difficult to know how much weight would have been given to these claims during the trial itself, and if the allegations of improper police conduct might have swayed the final verdict. Regardless of how he had got there, Andrew Everson, who had spent the last 12 months on remand, was finally free to go. Speaking to the Reading Evening Post, he said, Firstly, I would like to express my condolences to Susan Wardle, the aggrieved's common-law wife. I did not kill David. I have just spent twelve and a half months on remand, and it has been the worst year of my life. I'm glad it's over with, and the right decision was made by the jury. I just hope now it's finished with and I can pick up the pieces of my life. 
When asked about the shotgun, and again you'll hear more about this in part two, he said, I didn't buy a shotgun. There has been some stuff going on in the background in this case which didn't come out in court. I have no idea who killed David. Now, he said, he was just glad it was over with. For the family of David Watkins, however, who, following the not guilty verdict, had left the court in floods of tears, this can only have been a devastating time. First, they had been reassured that police had their man and had to sit through a nine-day trial in which all of the terrible details were rehashed. But following the failure of the prosecution, they then had to hear the lead investigator tell the press that while the case would, of course, remain open, they had no intention to reopen the incident room or to launch a second major inquiry. David's partner, Sue, was left to raise two young boys without their father. And then she could have had no idea that it would take until their two sons were adults for the truth of what happened that January night to finally be revealed. This episode of Outlines was researched, written, performed and produced by Jess Carter. The music was composed by Elias Hardy. 